Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on here in the Sermon on the Mount, seeing what true Christianity is supposed to look like. Um, we are going to pick up where, you know, let me, I'm going to ask Alice if you will read Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And if you have a Bible, open up, follow along, have a pen and paper, pencil and paper, and make notes. Would okay. you like me to pray before we start? No, I want you to read the scripture and then we'll pray. Oh, How's that? Sounds like a plan. All right, this is uh, Matthew 7, starting in chapter, verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And that's our topic for the last couple of programs, yes. is about judgment what it is, where it should be applied, and where it should be denied and stayed away from. So before we get into that, now you can pray, my oh, dear. Hallelujah. Father, we just come before you with humble hearts, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity yes. to bring your word, your precious word, out to those who have hearts that are ready to receive it. And Father, we just ask that you let nothing come out of our mouths that isn't from you. And we just thank you and praise you and give you all the glory and all of the honor. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, the last program, last, last week, mm -hmm. we talked about the things that you should not judge. Jesus said, do not judge lest you be judged. But right. um, I'm, I'm going to show you, and there's no contradiction in God's word, that there are places where we are not to judge. Mm -hmm. But there are places where we are to judge. Now, I'm using that word judiciously. How do you like that? Okay. <laughs> Justice. Because you can kind of substitute talking about the word examine, All right. test, mm -hmm. try. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to examine all things and hold fast to that, which is, and that's what the Word of God says. Right. But when you're doing that, you're, you're, you're judging it to see whether it is a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And I talked about last week, and we'll mention this a few times, I'm sure, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, where it says that the solid food of the Word, the meat of the Word, is for the mature, who because of practice has his senses trained to discern between good and evil. Yes. Okay? And we talked last week about the fact that, well, we are, according to 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's writing to the church there, we are to judge things inside the church. We're absolutely not to judge the people outside the church. All right? That's yes. God's job. All right? And from what Alice has read, by the measure that we judge by, that's the measure we'll be judged, that we use to judge. Mm -hmm. That's what we will be judged by. If you're judging by the Word of God, and there is no other way to test or examine or try anything, mm -hmm. then you better be prepared to be judged by the Word. Right. Well, I am. Because Jesus said, that's what, we'll, that's what we will be judged by on that last day, is by his word. Whether you lived according to his word, or, or didn't live according to his word. Um, and it's not a matter of salvation by works, it's a matter of being obedient to him. He, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes. All right. But the first thing is, now remember, this part is, he said, don't, don't try and take the speck out of your brother's eye. Mm -hmm. When you have a log in your own eye. But it's talking about brothers, yes. those inside the church. Not in the world. So please take note of that fact, all right? And this has to start with, and this is what Jesus is saying, don't do anything. Don't, don't look at that speck in your brother's eye until you've taken the log out of your own. All of God's righteous judgment starts with us examining ourselves, ourselves okay? This is what, go read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and see. That's what Paul says, let a man examine himself, right? We are, and this is what's so dangerous today. I, I, I find that there are people 
who are used, there are false prophets, there are false teachers, there are false apostles, and they're hiding behind this verse. Yes, they are. Saying, and you know, Psalm 105 says, touch not my anointing. Well, the, the fact of the matter is they're self-proclaimed anointing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they're hiding behind that verse when they might be wolves in sheep's clothing. Amen. Now, a wolf in sheep's clothing is going to look like a sheep. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? That's what a definition is, you know. That, that's what they're dressed and covered in. That's what it's going to look like. But you got to get to the heart of the matter. You have to see. And, and there are ways to do that. John wrote in his first letter, mm -hmm. okay, don't try this until you've judged yourself. Right. Make sure that you are in the right place with the Lord, abiding in his word. Mm -hmm. But it says, test the, the prophets, test the spirits. Many false prophets have, are gone abroad, right? Yes. We're living in a world that is filled Filt. with false prophets. Absolutely. Now, there have always been false prophets. Yes. Because it has always been the purpose of the devil, that liar, that father of lies, and a liar by nature, to misinform the people of God. Mm -hmm. This is why Jesus could have said to, to people, John chapter 8, go look it up. He said to these people who had rejected him, he said, you are your father. They're, they're proclaiming they're of the, their father Abraham. And Jesus said, you're, you're, you're of your father the devil. Does that sound judgmental? Well, of course it is. It's an assessment of the truth. But it is based on the Word of God. Does it sound loving? Well, you know what? All love starts with love of the Father. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all right? How are you going to know if somebody is preaching the truth, a prophet comes along, what they're saying is true or not, if you don't test them? Mm -hmm. One of the things, in, you know, in Scripture, it talks about the fact that one way you test a prophet is if what he says doesn't come to pass. Well, That's my right. goodness gracious, I see prophets self-called, self-proclaimed. People with business cards that say, prophet on it. Mm -hmm. And they're making all these prophecies and they don't come to pass. What's the consequence of that? Not a thing. Not, not at least at this time on this yeah, planet. I was say, not yet. Not yet. But how do you test the prophets? Well, we talked about the Bereans. When Paul went and preached in Berea, mm -hmm. he commended, he talks about, the Bible talks about the fact that these Bereans were more noble-minded than others because they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was That's true. true. Mm -hmm. When you hear something, do you search the scriptures to see if what they're saying is correct, that it lines up with the word? It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they don't speak according to this, that it's because they have no dawn in them. There's no light in them. That's what the, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah. You're supposed to teach. You're supposed to test, examine, try all teaching. Yes. Now, if you if this is if this is the first of these programs that you're watching, perhaps you've never heard me say this. Mm -hmm. But if you've seen any of the programs before, you have. I'm, I, I have a certain certain. Certainty, a certainty that you have heard me say, don't take my word for anything. Test what I say. Test it against yeah. the scripture. If what I'm saying doesn't line up with scripture, turn this off. But if what I'm saying lines up with the word of God, if what I'm saying is the word of God, then you are accountable for it having heard it. You are responsible. But you need to test what I'm saying against the scriptures. Not the way it makes you feel on the inside. Yeah. Not the way it, you know, not, not the way we look sitting here. You have to judge with a righteous judgment. You have to examine. You have to test. You have to try with a righteousness. And that the only way that is, is God's word is holy and pure. He uses his word to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Yes, this is our measuring rod. This is our standard. The only one. Mm -hmm. The only one. If you start to t test, by the way, you like the way that guy sounds, you like the way that guy talks, you like the way that, you're going to be led astray. You will follow any wolf that comes along dressed like a Christian. We are called, and I, I mentioned this earlier, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about that we need to judge sinful activity in the church, yes. and we need to deal with it. We are not to tolerate it. We need, I said this last week, we need to become intolerant of sin. 
Yeah. We were just having a little fellowship with brothers here in Manchester, England, brother and sister. And talking about, you know, the, one of the things that I don't see in the church so very much anymore is a fear of the Lord. Yes. Or not being afraid of a, 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 you know, a God who's waiting for opportunity to do you in. No, a, the, a sense of the awesomeness of our God who is a consuming mm -hmm. fire. The fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge, it's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, it says in Proverbs 8, is to hate evil, hate sin. We need to become intolerant of sin in the body of Christ, starting with ourselves. You need to be intolerant of sin in your own life. And what will that do when you find sin in your life? And you know what? It's, it's going to be there. We all, we all, we all fall, fall short, short right, yeah. of the glory of God. But when it's there, we have, it should bring remorse because it should pain us if we hate sin. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, he said, The very thing I hate, I continue to do. But he hated it. Yes. And that's what led him to an understanding that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That, that's how he starts the next chapter in Romans 8, the right. most, one of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. So when we become intolerant to sin in our own lives, then we are allowed, having removed the log from our own, yes, we need to deal with the sin in others. Jesus said, if you see your brother sin, well, if you... If you see it as sin, you've made a judgment. You have judged that that behavior, that activity, doesn't line up with God's word. It's not done in faith. It's sin. So what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed you go to do? to that brother. You go to the brother. You don't go to somebody else and start talking about it. God hates gossip. Yes. And if you're speaking to somebody else about the sin rather than the brother that you saw sin, you're gossiping. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be looking, going around looking for sin no. in everybody's life. No, you don't have you, no, 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 no. We should be looking for the pure, the holy, the That's blessed. Right. We should be looking for those things. But you know what? Sin becomes obvious to us. So when you see it, yes, then you address it. Because when you have fixed your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of your faith, who is holy, you will recognize unholiness when you encounter it. Yes. Now, our purpose is not to run around being judgmental. Yeah. The purpose of this is not for condemnation, but for correction. Because the body has to work properly. God disciplines those whom he loves. Hebrews chapter 12. If you haven't read this, if you don't believe it, and you're taking somebody else's word for the fact that God doesn't discipline anymore, go read New Testament. Go read the letter to the Hebrews and see that he disciplines those whom he loves. Mm -hmm. You know why? That we might be partakers in his holiness. Yes. If God doesn't discipline you, it's because you're not a child of his. Mm -hmm. If God doesn't discipline you, you're not going to partake in his holiness. It should be our desire. You know, I think David prayed in the Psalms and he said, he, he prayed that God would mm -hmm. send brothers and sisters into his life yes. to help him find the things that were not right in his life and that he would not allow his head to reject it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your natural man doesn't want to hear that, no. you're, do, that you're doing wrong. You don't, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. But the Spirit of God within you and the Spirit of you within you desires mm -hmm. to be in that place where you're pleasing to God. Yes. Didn't Paul write to Timothy? Yes, he did. Paul wrote to Timothy in the, in the second chapter, in the, the second letter, the second chapter. And he said, study to show yourself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. That should be your great desire is the approval of God, that you know that you're doing what's right in God's eyes. So if you're doing what's wrong in God's eyes, it should be your great desire to have that exposed yes. so that you can deal with it in your life. That, by the way, is the ministry of the prophets. It says this in um, Lamentations, the second chapter, the 14th verse. It says that the... Do me a favor. Write that down, and then you go look at it. Mm -hmm. But what it's saying is that there were the false prophets, they were, they were there. They were not exposing the iniquity of God's people. Right. Well, if you're exposing the iniquity, you had to recognize that, and you're, and you're judging. Mm -hmm. But you're not judging for condemnation. You are judging for correction. God sent the prophets to correct, to restore us into a right relationship with Him. Right. Okay? You know, a good it's, example it's of this... It's bringing the, the body of Christ into a holier state. Yeah. It, it, a really good example of this is, I'm sure you know the account of a woman who was caught in adultery. Yes. And, and these Pharisees mm. 
they bring this woman into the presence of Jesus Christ. And they say, you know, we caught her committing adultery. Because why? They're trying to put Jesus to the test to see how he will react. Because the law says that if a woman is caught in adultery, if a man's caught in adultery too, by the way, mm -hmm. if a woman's caught in adultery, she needs to be stoned to death. That's right. So on the one hand, here's Jesus who's preaching this love, and they're saying to him, well, what do you have to say about this? Because they, they, they have him trapped, you see. Yes. Either he says, go ahead and stone her, and then he's not living this love that he has. Mm -hmm. Or he says, let her go, and he's not living the law. Right. So they thought they had him trapped. So if you know the account, he writes, he kneels down and, and writes in the sand. No, I don't know what he wrote in the sand. I don't know if he, uh, you know, I, I, we have a dear brother. We're here and Morris Barat in Barat Ministries in, in Manchester in the UK. And he says that he believes that Jesus was just doodling in the sand. Mm -hmm. Now, that may sound strange to you. But he has a good point because he said Jesus didn't come to bring condemnation. No. So he may not have written their sins as, as many people hypothesize. But whatever he wrote, they got up and they drifted off. They walked away. And Jesus says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? They were all gone. Well, now you want to know something? Yes, the law says that somebody, a woman caught in adultery, she should be stoned. But the law also says that there have to be witnesses. So That's Jesus right. said, where are, the, where are the witnesses? Where are the accusers? Where are the accusers? Where are the witnesses? They're gone. And none. None there. So she has said, been set free from that law. It's according to the law. So according right. to the law, Jesus was right when he said, go. There's no accusers, right? And by the way, on that day, no that, more, right? on that day that I faced judgment, I want to promise you, that the accuser, the accuser of the brethren, isn't going to be there to bring charges against me. Hallelujah. That's and right. I have an advocate with the Father. But that's a, So Alice just said that, and I don't know if you heard that. Jesus said, go. Go and sin no more. So he recognized that there was sin in her life. Mm -hmm. Is that a judgment? Well, of course it is. But he's not there to condemn her. He is there to correct her. Yes. If you see something in a brother's life, you go to him. Not to say, nah, nah, I see why you do this, but to go there and, and bring this to his attention or her attention so that sin might be corrected. Mm -hmm. The desire of God is repentance, right. that we turn from sin in our life. You will do that You'll, if you have a fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil. You'll hate the sin in your own life, all right? Absolutely. <clears throat> so... You can go, please, go read this. We can't do everything in this study because no, it just... There's so much. There's so much and there's so little, little time, time to do it all. But go read that account of what Jesus says, you know, if you see your brother sin. You don't go to them for condemnation. You go to them for correction. If you see them sin, if you're going there, you, you are, in a sense, you have judged. You have examined what they've done. You've seen what they've done. You've tested what they've done. It doesn't line up with the Word of God. Well, then they're in sin. So you go to that brother and you point that out. You're willing to pray. You, by the way, you point it out according to the word. If you're going to correct somebody, correct them. The word of God is profitable. Second Timothy chapter 3. Yes. Paul says all scriptures, God breathed and profitable. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. Don't go and tell people, well, I think, and it's your opinion of what they did is wrong. Your opinion doesn't have any weight whatsoever. No. God's not asking for your opinion. No, 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 no. The Word of God is what has power. The Word of God is what Isaiah 55 says, that God's Word will not go forth without accomplishing His purpose, right? We used to, you know, we've started and, and run Christian schools in the States, and we did discipline the children, mm -hmm. okay? Discipline means we instruct them, we disciple them. How's that? that make you feel better? We disciple those children. Yes. But if they did something that was wrong, we had a policy in the school. You, you know, you did something wrong, you'd get a demerit. Mm -hmm. And that demerit would, would cost you something in terms of the benefits of being in school. And if you got a certain number of demerits in a, in a day, you got a spanking. Yes. And all of the parents and all of the children had, ag had agreed to these terms when they came Prior to the school. To being admitted. Right. But we had, now I, I started the school, I was the pastor of this church, I was the principal of the school when it started. 
a very, very set program in place. You would take that child and you would sit down with that child. Mm -hmm. You would show them in the word of God what they had done is wrong. So what they had done to God. Well, because right. then it's not a matter of how I feel that day. No. You know, I got, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, you know, the expression, and therefore, you know, I'm being angry and I'm taking this. The same standard is applied to every single child in the school. Mm -hmm. Same standard. That standard is the Word of God. So we would show them in the Word. And then whatever discipline was going to be done was done. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that discipline, we would sit down with them and we would pray with them. Our purpose was not to punish them. No. Our purpose was to correct. It's not about punishment. What you know, I don't I don't want to live in a world where it's about punishment. Yeah. But I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that involves being disciplined. And by the way, that's one of the reasons I don't like to hear the word that is so commonly used in the body today, mentored. Mentor. That's a worldly term. Well, <laughs> the word mentor, by the way, was a person's name. In Greek mythology, it's, I think it's from Homer's either the Odyssey or the Iliad, and he was an advisor to the king's son. Jesus Christ is not an advisor. No, he's not. He is Lord, and there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Advisors give you advice, and, and then you're free to choose whether you want to do it or not. or not. Jesus Christ gives commandments, and he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? Why have we gotten so far away from the discipline of the Lord? Because we've gotten away from the fear of the Lord. Yeah. There is no fear of the Lord. Yeah, that's obvious. Okay. This, I, you know, this whole topic that we're, the, that we're dealing with, discipline, truly is hard. It is because it's like we don't, in a, our natural state, we don't want discipline in our lives. And if you don't have rule in your life, if you don't have a Lord in your life, you know, it says in Judges a number of times, it says, when there was no king in Israel, Every man did what was right in his own eyes. You want to do what you think you want to do. You want to do what's right in your eyes. So the fact is, if God has made a promise that he will lead us in paths of righteousness, for his name's sake, by the way, mm -hmm. then he has to have a way of leading us all the same. He, because God is not partial to any man. No. He's no respecter of persons, is what it says in the Word. So what has to happen is... The same standard has to be used in my life as in your life, as in Alice's life. And that standard is the Word of God. It says in Psalm 119, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the Word. Everything has to be tested according to the Word of God. It, you know, Paul wrote, and he said, those who are outside, God judges. Yes. This is 1 Corinthians 5, 13, right? God judges the ones outside. But he says to, to the church, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Mm -hmm. We need to deal with the sin in the church. And it's obvious that we're not doing a good job at that. So if you just look at this verse, these verses, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, superficially, well, it, it sounds like there's a contradiction here, but I promise you there is no contradiction with God. Jesus the Messiah who was sent by the Father to save sinful mankind, mm -hmm. Jesus who says in John chapter 3 that he did not come to judge, then calls this, the Pharisees snakes and vipers and whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, mm -hmm. and tells them that they're of their father the devil. And just in a few verses later here in Matthew, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. So is he contradicting himself? No. Absolutely not. You don't judge from within you. We judge with a righteous judgment. We test things according to the Word of God. We examine things based on the Word of God. How else could he do this? That requires judging. The role, I, I, I mentioned this before, but I want to do it again, right? Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14. This is the, this is the role of a true prophet. And that role seems to be to judge. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. The prophets were sent 
to proclaim God's judgment, not their own. And the purpose was to restore people, expose iniquity, to restore people from iniquity. If there is sin in your life, you are a slave of sin. Because you are either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. So that's not the judgment of Jeremiah when he says that. That's the judgment of God. Ephesians 5.11. This is New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Paul writes and he says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose oh. them. How can you expose deeds of unfruitful deeds of darkness unless you recognize that they are, unless you test them, unless you judge them to be so? I, this time just flies by. Yeah. It's amazing. Years ago, years ago in New York City, I did, a, I did a weekly radio show, a live weekly radio show on secular radio in New York. And uh, I continually heard from people uh, that I was too judgmental. Or I had no love. Mm. But in point of fact, I was then, as I am now, motivated by love. Yes. Speaking the truth, putting what the Lord had put in my heart, speaking that... Because love rejoices with the truth, right? The same love that caused John and Jesus both to cry out, repent to the sinners of their time. In these last days, and this is what Jesus said when he was asked, Matthew 24, he said there will be an explosion of false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus and Paul both make perfectly clear, in Matthew 24 and 2 Timothy 3, the last thing in the world that Satan wants is for believers to be judging or testing those evil workers. Satan doesn't want you putting to the test those wolves in sheep's clothing and showing them to be what they are. He wants you trapped in a lie, a lie that keeps you in bondage and captivity. God doesn't want us to judge for condemnation. He doesn't want us to judge according to our own opinions, but he wants us to test all things and judge with a righteous judgment to correct, to bring a word of correction that we love one another. I keep telling people in these days, you know, we travel all over and I say we are blessed to live in exciting times, but I keep telling people you need to have good fellowship. Yes. Remember it says in 1 Corinthians 15, bad company spoils good morals. You need good fellowship. And true good fellowship is being around people who love you enough when they see you doing something that doesn't line up with the Word of God. They will love you enough to come and tell you. Hallelujah. <clears throat> they're encouraging you. Well, they're, they're coming to correct you. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to judge you in a, in a way of condemnation. No. But if you're not around those kind of people, get around those kind of people. Because we need that. As iron sharpens iron, so one man another. So, Father, I thank you that you've put other people in our lives, yes. Lord God. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. that there is a remnant still to this day. There are people whose heart's desire is to be those bond servants, Lord yes. God, who are willing to live and walk according to your word. Not just to hear your word, but to do your word, Lord God. Give us a boldness of spirit, Lord God, that comes with that love. Because perfect love, your love, casts out fear. Help us, Lord God, to love each other enough to bring a word of truth. Hallelujah. God bless you. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I'll cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies at last.